Morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning. I've switched my f location in the room to a different spot to see if the internet will work a little bit better. We'll see what happens. <laughs> As Megan can attest to, it was really, really bad trying to talk to her yesterday. So, um, yes. <laughs> yes, it was really bad. Uh, I did contact Sprint, that is my cell phone provider, which is where, use it, where I get all my internet, and they're supposed to be sending me what they call a magic box. So hopefully the magic box will make things better. We'll see what happens. Sounds exciting. It does sound exciting, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, any questions about anything before we get going? going through like the Graham Schmidt uh, procedure. That's what, yeah, that's what we're going to go through today. Yep. Okay. I didn't fully understand like all of the examples and things. Yep. I get that. That's why I want to, I want to do an example of that today, an example or two today. And then uh, I'll, I'll probably post another video as well to show another example. And I'm actually currently working on a if you've got a TI-84, I'm working on a program for the TI-84 that'll do some of these operations with vectors, and hopefully I can actually get it to do the Gram-Schmidt process, at least for Euclidean vectors, where you can actually check your answers a little bit more quickly, hopefully. We'll see. We'll see if I can get it to work or not. I do have it working where it'll actually do the uh, inner product, and it'll calculate uh, the magnitude, and it'll calculate the angle between two vectors. I did that last night. That was kind of fun. Something new. Any other questions about anything at all? Homework going okay? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. All right. Well, let's go ahead and talk about Gram-Schmidt process today. To get to that point, we need to talk about orthogonal and orthonormal sets. Before I talk about that even, there was one thing I wanted to mention about one of the parts of the procedure that we have to do for Gram-Schmidt involves doing a projection of one vector onto another. And that was, I believe, in the, the uh, video that I asked you to watch too, but the, uh, the handout as well. So I just want to go through that for just a second from a Euclidean sense. So let's say you've got... Let's say I have a vector V and I have another vector W. Now, there's W in this regard kind of goes in V's direction somewhat, okay? So to talk about the idea of how much, if you will, of W goes in the V direction, there is this idea of projection, and here's how that works. From a Euclidean sense, you take the vector w and you go perpendicular down to v and then you look at this vector that's along v. So this vector that I just drew in here is what we refer to as the projection of w onto v. That's the notation. So the subscript for the V is the thing that's getting projected onto, and then W is the vector that you started with. Um, another way to think about it is almost like a shadow, is it, it's kind of a physical representation of it. So you've got this W standing up here. If you've got some sort of a light source above it, this would be the shadow of W onto V. So if you're thinking about if the sun's shining behind you, and what does your shadow look like when it hits the ground kind of idea. That's the, the yeah. that's, 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 well, it's not an exact analogy, but that's the idea. If you were standing way above this and looking straight down, this is what W would look like on top of V. It's a shadow idea. All right, well, the first thing that we can compute with this projection is how long it is, because we know how to calculate the angle between two vectors. I know that the cosine of theta is going to be the inner product of V and W, and then over the magnitude of each of those things. 
<clears throat> pardon me. So uh, this cosine of the angle is equal to that. So I know how to figure out the length of this projection because I also know that the cosine in terms of lengths would be what? It would be the length of the projection vector. That's the adjacent side. Oops, I wrote those backwards. The length of the projection vector over the length of the hypotenuse, which would be the W vector. Just using right triangle trig, right? All right, so if I just simplify a little bit, we get that the length of the projection vector is equal to the inner product of the two vectors over, notice that the magnitude of W goes away, and we get the magnitude of V. So we've figured out a way to calculate the length of the projection vector, just using a little bit of right, uh, right triangle trig on the left side here, and um, our knowledge of how we calculate angle between two vectors here on the right hand side. This actually has a name as well. This is called the component of W along V. So C-O-M-P for component. The thing we need to know for our purposes is the projection. So we found the length. So that tells us basically how far along V W goes, but we don't actually have a formula for the vector. But one thing that we do notice is that the projection vector either points in the same direction of V as V does, or it's gonna point in the exact opposite direction that V does. If my W is sticking out this way, then my projection vector would go in the exact opposite direction. Either way, the projection vector is a scalar multiple of V. No matter which way we think about it, the projection vector is a scalar multiple. So I know that this projection vector, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> that was a big sneeze. <laughs> Phew. Bless you. <laughs> so I know that this projection vector is so, <laughs> some scalar multiple of the V, and I just need to figure out what the scalar is here, where I'm putting this little dotted line. All right, so I know the length of the projection vector. I know the length is this component, this dot, pro the inner product of V and W divided by the magnitude of W. So the way we can make sure that it has the right size is to first make this a unit vector by dividing V by its magnitude, by its norm. So we can check pretty quickly that if I take a vector, I'll write it up here at the top, if I take a vector and divide it by its magnitude and then worry about its length, I know it's a lot of vertical bars there, but if I take out, I take a vector and divide it by its length, its new length is gonna be one. Because remember, with one of our properties of length, one of our properties of magnitude, is that we can pull constants out. This magnitude is just a constant, so I can pull it out in front. Technically, we pull it out with absolute values, but of course, we know that magnitude is never negative, so I don't have to worry about absolute value. And then your magnitudes would just cancel. So this trick is all this is doing is converting V into what we refer to as a unit vector, a vector of length one that points in the same direction as V does. And then to put the right scale on it, to make sure it has the same length as the projection vector that we want, we'll stick in our, we'll stick in our V and W in here and divide by the magnitude of V. All I'm putting in there is that computation that we just did for the component. 
And now we have a nice new formula, which I'm going to write a little bit nicer because this is all over the place. But the, the uh, actual formula for the projection of W onto V is going to be the inner product of V and W over the inner product of V with itself. Because now notice that we've got the magnitude of V squared on bottom, and that is just the inner product of V with itself times V. One of the things that I like to point out for this particular formula is that notice that W is the vector that we're rejecting, uh, projecting onto another vector, and it's only in this one spot in the formula. Everywhere else is the V. So this one that we're projecting onto is the V that's everywhere else in the formula. The W is only used in that one spot. Now again, this is we need this formula to help us with that Gram-Schmidt process that was in the handout that I sent to you. Anyway, I just wanted to go through the derivation of where this comes from. The important part is that you know that formula for our purposes. All right. So let's see if we can get to this process uh, by a couple of definitions here that won't take too long, and then we'll actually get into some nitty-gritty, do some example ideas here. So we need the idea of orthogonal and orthonormal sets. So we say that a set is orthogonal if whenever you take two vectors in the set, that aren't equal, then the two vectors are orthogonal to each other. Oops, use the actual inner product notation. And by orthogonal, remember, we mean that their inner product is zero. So that's what we mean by an orthogonal set. So whenever you take two distinct vectors from the set, and take their inner product, you get zero. A set is orthonormal if it's orthogonal. So orthonormal set has to be orthogonal and it has an extra condition that the magnitude of every vector in the set is one. So the normal part of orthonormal means that every vector has length one. Every vector is a unit vector. So there's two pieces to the definition there. The ortho part is referring to the fact that everything is orthogonal to each other. Everything in a Euclidean sense, everything is perpendicular to each other. And the normal part is that everything has the same length and that length is one. Everything's a unit vector. So let's look at this first example here. The first example says we either give us a set. It asks us first to show that the set is an orthogonal set. And then second, it asks us to construct an orthonormal set from the orthogonal one. So this is part of the half of this problem is going to be part of the Gram-Schmidt process, essentially. We're given that, we're, well, we're told that this is going to be an orthogonal set, so we're going to show that part. And then the constructing the orthonormal part is actually part of the Gram-Schmidt process. It's the, the second piece of the Gram-Schmidt process, if you will. All right, so to show that it's orthogonal, we just need to show that the inner product of any two distinct vectors here is zero. And I'm going to use the dot notation since these are Euclidean vectors, so I don't have to write the brackets all the time. So if I take the inner product of two, those two vectors, the dot product of those two vectors, we really do get zero. If I take the inner product of the 4, 1, 2 with the negative 1, negative 2, 3, I get negative 4 minus 2 plus 6. I also get zero. And if I take the...
3, negative 6, negative 3 vector, and take the dot product with a negative 1, negative 2, 3 vector. We get what? Negative 3 uh, plus 12 minus 9 also gives me 0. So again, to show that this particular set is orthogonal, I just needed to take all possible pairs of vectors in the set, do their inner products, and show that they're all zero. So this computation here shows that S is an orthogonal set. Now, certainly, S is not orthonormal yet because clearly none of these vectors has length 1. I get that without even doing any computations, you can tell that those vectors are going to be longer than one unit long if you think about it in Euclidean sense. So the way we turn it into an orthonormal set is that we're going to first take the magnitude of each of the vectors. So the first vector has magnitude, what, square root of 16 plus 1 plus 4. Remember we do the, in the Euclidean sense, we're just going to do the square of each component and add it together. So that one is square root of 21. This one is square root of 9 plus 36 plus 9, square root of 54. And this one square root of 1 plus 4 plus 9 gives me square root of 14 if I did my arithmetic correctly. So now we remember what I just talked about kind of in the middle of the doing the projection uh, formulation, the projection derivation. Remember I said that if you take a vector, no matter what vector it is, and divide it by its magnitude, you turn it into a vector that has length 1. So to create this set T from the set S, we're going to take each of the vectors that we had, the 4, 1, 2, the 3, negative 6, negative 3, and the negative 1, negative 2, 3, and divide each of them by their magnitudes. So the set T here will be 1 over the square root of 21 times the 4, 1, 2. Um, then we'll take 1 over the square root of 54. Uh, what is that? 3 root 6. If I want to be fancy and simplify it, I don't really care if you simplify the radicals. And then the other one's 1 over root 14 times um, negative 1, negative 2, 3. So the, once you have an orthogonal set, the construction of the orthonormal part is not the, anything that's a big deal. You just need to take the magnitude of each of the vectors and divide that magnitude out for each vector. Any questions on that one at all? All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about why we care about orthogonal sets in general. So the reason why we care about orthogonal sets is because if we have an orthogonal set, we already know automatically that it's a linearly independent set. We don't have to do any extra work. If we have something that's orthogonal, we already know it's linearly independent without any other issues. So going back up to the previous example, since this, this set S is orthogonal, I know for a fact it forms a basis for um, R3 in this case, since these are vectors from R3. So I already know that it forms a basis without doing any other work since it's orthogonal. So in general, if we can construct an orthogonal set, then we know it's linearly independent and we construct bases these ways, th this way. And we'll talk a little bit more about why we like orthogonal bases and orthonormal bases. So let's talk about how we know that this is linearly independent. <clears throat> Pardon me. So let's say you have let's say you have a linear combination of these vectors.
that gives you the zero vector. We need to show that each of the I need to show that each of the constants here is zero then. Uh, there's probably there's one extra piece that I should have put in here that I need to make sure that my vectors are non-zero. We know that any set that has the zero vector in there is going to make the set linearly dependent. As soon as you throw the zero vector in there, it's automatically linearly dependent. And the zero vector is automatically orthogonal to everything else. So in here, I should tell us to assume that that none of these vectors is zero. Well, we're trying to figure. We're trying to form bases here, so I'm not going to throw the zero vector in a set to try to make a basis. Is basically what I'm saying here. So. We're going to assume that these vectors are not zero. All right, so we need to, sh to show that it's linearly independent. We need to show that all of the constants here are zero, right? We start with a linear combination that gives us a zero vector. To show that it's linearly independent, we have to show that each individual constant is zero. So the way we're going to do this now is just we're going to take the inner product of both sides here with a v sub i. Let's leave r i be arbitrary to some number between 1 and n. We'll take our v sub i and do the inner product with this long sum. And on the right hand side, we'll have the inner product with v sub i and the zero vector. Now we just use some properties of inner product. Remember that the axioms two and three for inner product spaces allow us to distribute over sums and pull constants out. So the left hand side, you'll get an inner pro oops, sorry, you'll get a K1, an inner product with VI and V1. Somewhere in the middle, there's a KI and an inner product of VI with itself. And at the end, you'll have a VI and an inner product with a VN. This again is the left-hand side. After we've distributed the, distributed the VI over the sum and pulled the constants Ks out in front. On the right-hand side, we know the inner product of a vector with the zero vector is just zero. Now we're assuming that we have an orthogonal set here, so each of these individual inner products are zero. Except for this one here. The one where we have the inner product of V sub i with itself is not zero. But since the set itself is orthogonal, I know all of those other inner products are zero. So we get to the point where we have ki vi vi is equal to zero. And this is why I needed the assumption that I put in parentheses at the start. Since vi is not zero, I know that its inner product with itself is not zero. So that tells us that the k sub i had to be zero.
And remember, again, the whole point of this was to show that each of the k sub i's is zero. Well, we left i to be arbitrary when we just dot product or took the inner product with v sub i on both sides. So this was arbitrary. So each of the k sub i's has to be zero. So thus, the set has to be linearly independent. So just to write that down as a conclusion, since each k sub i is equal to zero for i equals one to n, S is linearly independent. Any questions on that at all? Okay. So, orthogonal sets are automatically linearly independent. So we're going to talk about now why we care about such things. So, uh, an orthogonal basis is just means that it's a basis for V that is also an orthogonal set. And then likewise, an orthonormal basis is a basis for V that's an orthonormal set. spell. And the next theorem is exactly why we care about orthonormal bases in particular. One of the things that we're interested in when we're talking about vectors are their coordinates with respect to a basis. For example, when you write vectors in R3 as, say, an x, y, z, when you write those as coordinates, we're really, this is really a shorthand for writing it as a linear combination of the standard base, basis vectors for R3. We have three vectors that we know can generate every other vector in R3. And one thing that we notice here is that I know what the constants are immediately. And again, notice that if I take the inner product with the x, y, z, with the 1, 0, 0, I get the x. If I take the inner product with the x, y, z, with the 0, 1, 0, I get the y. And likewise, I get the z. So that's what the theorem tells Am I cutting out a lot again? Oh, jeez. Of course I am. Good news is it's recording. I did remember to do that this morning. I tried moving my phone again. Like I said, hopefully the magic box will do something. <laughs> All right. So again, like I mentioned here, that I can notice that if I just take, if I take the vector x, y, z and do its inner product with each of these standard basis vectors, I get the coordinates. I get the x, y, z. So that's one of the things that we like about orthonormal bases is that it, the way you can get the coordinates, the way you can get those constants that pop up in the linear combination is to take the inner product of the vector you're interested in with the other vectors. So let's see why that works. Since S is a basis, we know there exist, I'll say K1 out to Kn such that The W is equal to the K1 V1 plus the K2 V2 out to KN VN. And the idea here is to figure out what each of the K 
k's are. That's our idea here is we need to figure out what the k's are. So much like what we just did in the previous proof, I'm going to do the inner product with a v, an arbitrary v sub i on both sides. And then, just like on the previous one, I can pull out the constants and distribute over all of the sums. and get that expression on the right hand side. Now, in the previous theorem, we were given just an orthogonal basis, but this one we're given even more information. We're given the fact that it's an orthonormal basis. So, orthonormal includes orthogonal, so each of these where the i is not equal to the other subscript, so the v1, vi, vn, vi, all of those are all zero because they're orthogonal. This one is not zero, but since it's orthonormal, I know that the length of v sub i is one, so this is one because I know that the length of the v sub i itself is just a one. So we get that that k sub i has to be the, the w, which I'm forgetting to put its little hat on. It might catch cold if I don't put its hat on. The, uh, the, the inner product of the v, w with the v sub i has to be those k sub i. So each of these pieces here each of those constants that you multiply by the v's are the individual pieces, are the individual coordinates with respect to the bases. So that allows us to do things like calculate lengths of vectors and distances of vectors and inner product of vectors like you would in a Euclidean sense. That's the whole point of doing all of this. That if you have an orthonormal basis and you have coordinates with respect to that basis, then you can calculate things like length, like distance, like inner product, just like you would for Euclidean vectors. It's really the whole point of why we care about these orthonormal ideas is because Basically, they all behave like Euclidean vectors in that sense, once you have their coordinate vectors. And that's a big idea. Because this, this makes the calc, it doesn't matter how weird the inner product gets. I know that in some of the problems that you're working on for your homework, you've got weird inner products. When you want to do things that involve trying to approximate functions with other functions, you tend to get weird inner products. But it doesn't, this, this theorem says it doesn't matter how weird the inner product gets. It says that if you have an orthonormal basis to start with, and you know the coordinates with respect to the orthonormal basis, you can calculate usual Euclidean ideas in a usual Euclidean way. That's a big deal. And it's cool that it works out that way because it makes it makes things from a computational perspective much easier. If you're doing what's referred to as numerical linear algebra, trying to do these types of things that are actual applications of things, actually trying to approximate. One of the things that you do in electronics, for example, is that you have um, you have things that turn on and off, and you try to approximate. 
on and off is basically a discontinuous function, right? It goes, it, it jumps up to one, it turns off, it goes to zero. It jumps up to one, it turns off, it goes to zero. Those are discontinuous functions, but you can approximate those discontinuous functions with continuous things that are also periodic, namely the trig functions. When you're trying to approximate those things, you want to know how good those approximations are. You need to be able to calculate things like magnitudes. That tells you how good approximations are. If you want to calculate those magnitudes efficiently, you would rather have them as a Euclidean sense idea than a function sense where you have to do some sort of an integral. It's nicer to be able to do approximations in this fashion. So this is the point. This is why we care. I'm not going to worry about the proof of that. It's not a bad proof. I'm just not going to worry about doing it. So anyway, that's the whole idea. Why? Well, one of the whole ideas why we care. So this is why we do the Graham-Schmidt process. So at the very least, let me get you started on how the example works. All right. So here are three vectors in R3. And we want to convert it to an orthogonal basis. It's not too hard to check that this is a basis because we could do our standard stuff of put it in a matrix, row reduce, and see that we get the identity matrix. So it's not too difficult to see that we actually get a basis here. All right, so to, count, to compute your orthogonal basis, the first thing you do is you just let the first vector in your orthogonal basis be the first vector in your, in your set that you're talking about. So that's step one. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate the projection of V2 onto basically V1, onto the subspace W1. So to do that, remember we said we're going to take, this will be V1 dotted with V2 over V1 dotted with V1 times V1. Well, I made this computation pretty straightforward because V1 dotted with V2 is just going to be 3. V1 dotted with itself is just 1. And V1 is the vector 1, 0, 0. And so we get 3, 0, 0. From a picture standpoint, we've got the vector V1 here. I'm not going to try to draw it in three dimensions because that's ridiculous for me. Then you've got the vector V2 sitting somewhere else. What we just calculated was this projection down like so. This was our projection that we just calculated, that red arrow. Now this is in the same direction as V1. We want something that's orthogonal to V1, we want this vector that's pointing this way. The way we get that is by doing that subtraction. So our W2 here will just be your 3, 7, negative 2 minus your 3, 0, 0, which gives you 0, 7, negative 2. All right, so this is vector number two in our orthogonal basis. So this was vector number one. This is vector number two. So now you do the same thing, except that I've got to project this third one onto the subspace generated by the previous two. That sounds hard, but luckily, I just went away. Well, that was fun. I have no idea when I died. <laughs> it was right after you drew the picture. Oh, it was right after I drew the picture. Okay. So when I drew the picture, this vector, this red one here, this one at the bottom, is the one we calculated here. This is actually in the subspace that's generated by the V1. So we want the subspace that's ortho or we want the vector that's orthogonal 
so we subtract. So that's where the V2 minus the projection that we just calculated came from. Okay, so the, the, to do the next part, we need to calculate the projection of V3 onto the subspace generated by W1 and W2. Well, that just means that we've got some plane sitting out here. That would be the subspace generated by two vectors. And we've got some third vector sitting out here like this. And we want to calculate, I'll say, this red vector here. This is not a horribly complicated process because the way you do this is you just take the vector v3 and project it onto the other two vectors and add them together. Oops, this is times v2. That's how we get the projection of v3 onto the first two vectors. Uh, the first one was, I forgot what the third one is now. 0, 4, 1. Okay. I'm going to write that down so I don't forget what it was. All right. So the first one was 1, 0, 0. So this, project, this part's just going to be, if I do 1, 0, 0 dotted with this, I'm going to get 0, V1. And then if I do this one dotted with this one, the W2, you get, what, 26 over, and then I've got to do V2 dotted with itself. So that's 49 plus 4, so 53 V2, if I did my arithmetic correctly. Because I'm doing... V, this was, this should be my W2, not V2, sorry. This should be W's. Doing my W2 dotted with my V3. So I get 28 minus 2 gives me the 26. And then V2 dotted, or W2 dotted with itself is 49 plus 4. That gave me the 53. So that's the projection of V3 onto this subspace. And then finally, to calculate your W3, you take your V3 and subtract off this 26 over 53 times 0, 7, negative 2, whatever number that turns out to be. I'm not going to go through the arithmetic right now. That's what a calculator is for. But now that you've found your W3, we've, we had W1 and we had W2. W1 was um, 1, 0, 0. W2 was the 0, 7, negative 2. And then this last one is whatever that W3 is. That gives you an orthogonal basis. And then our last step would be to convert to an orthonormal which means that you divide by the magnitudes like we talked about before. And I'm going to stop there because I need to start my next class on a test. I'm going to do it. I promise I'm going to do another example of this next time and I'll get another video posted as well so that we can go through these examples and make sure that you're understanding the process that we're going through. So anyway, I will do that next time. Definitely. Uh, you've got your homework due Friday. Uh, holler at me if you've got questions about those things, and then otherwise I will talk to you all later. Thank you. Bye, everyone.